All right, let's uh, talk about common shares. And uh, we'll look at some of the defining features of common shares and some of the, the characteristics here. Um, if you own common stock, you are one of the owners of the company. You are said to have equity in the company. You have the last claim on assets, however. You're behind debt, all forms of debt, uh, and preferred shares. So you have what's called a residual claim on assets. You may be entitled to dividends. They're discretionary. That's why we say you may be entitled to dividends. If the company declares a dividend, then yes, you get it. Typically held in street name. This means that when you buy stock, you typically have a brokerage firm. Uh, it'll be held in that account, and the shares will be held in the name of the financial institution at which you have your account at, rather than in your own name. That is called a street certificate form, registered in the name of the securities firm rather than the beneficial owner. The benefit of that is it enhances ease of transfer. However, you don't lose any of the privileges associated with owning that stock. You still have the voting rights. You still get the dividend. Plus, let's look at some other things here. Potential for capital appreciation. As the value of the assets of the firm increases, the value of the equity increases, but the value of the debt doesn't. So you have capital appreciation, whereas debt does not. Voting privileges, you get to elect the board of directors, approve the financial statements, and a few other things as well. Favorable tax treatment of dividends and capital gains. Marketability, they are exchange traded. You can trade in and out of them. You can add to your position or reduce your position very easily. The right to attend the annual meeting. And at the annual meeting, if you have a question for management, you can put your question in, you can queue up in front of the microphone, and when it's your turn, you get to ask a question. And here's the big thing, you have limited liability. If you own $1,000 worth of stock of a company and they do some very bad things and they get sued, they, nobody can come after you. All you can lose is that $1,000 you put up. All right, let's dive into dividends a little deeper. On the previous screen, it was mentioned that um, holders of common shares may be entitled to dividends. I stress that word may because they're discretionary. They're non-contractual. Contrast that with interest payments on a bond where the company does not have discretion over that. Those interest payments must be made. They are contractual. Not so with the dividend. A dividend can be uh, what's called a regular dividend. This is a recurring dividend, which could be quarterly or monthly. Typically, corporations will pay dividends quarterly. Some will pay monthly, um, especially real estate investment trusts uh, and different tradable trusts will pay um, dividends monthly. Just be aware that there are um, shares out there that you can buy that may have a monthly dividend as opposed to the quarterly dividend. And companies can declare and pay an extra dividend. This is non-recurring. And companies would do this so that they're not um, expected to maintain it. Typically, when a company has a regular dividend, uh, even though they're discretionary, it's typically very hard to cancel that dividend without major damage to the stock price because it sends a signal to the marketplace that something is wrong. So companies very rarely, only in extreme conditions, would they cancel their dividend. So rather than increasing their dividend with extra cash flow, when they have extra cash flow, they might say, let's just keep this dividend in place that we have and we'll just issue extra dividends every now and then. Costco is a great example of a company that does that. It maintains a low dividend, that's a recurring dividend, and every two years it has a special dividend, an extra dividend where they pay out extra cash. It doesn't bind them to that higher level of dividend payment. The dividend policy of a, of a publicly traded company is determined by that company's board of directors. Uh, if we're dealing with a growth firm, growth firms typically retain all their income to fund further growth. Uh, so typically with growth firms, no dividends. Let's look at some terminology for dividends. We got a lot here. The declaration date, the dividend record date, the payment date, the cum dividend date, the ex dividend date. Woo. Let's start at the beginning, the declaration date. This is the date the company says, hey, we're going to pay a dividend to everybody that, who's a, a, um, an owner of record as of a certain date. That's called the dividend record date. I'll put an arrow there. And everybody who is a uh, shareholder of record on this date will get the payment over on this date. So that's fairly straight, right? The company declares the dividend on this date to everybody who owns shares on this date, and they'll get paid on this date. Now. Up here, I said the dividend is discretionary. However, 
on the declaration date, once a company declares a dividend, that specific dividend, not all dividends now, just that specific dividend is no longer discretionary. Now it's contractual. So that is one special case where the dividend is contractual is once the company declares that they're going to pay a dividend, that's it. It's a done deal. It's a contract. Well, how do you become a shareholder of record on the dividend record date? The settlement for equities is two days, which means we have to back up two days and we have to, be, we have to buy the stock or the shares of this company before the close of business, two days before the dividend record date. Then on that date, our name will appear uh, as a shareholder of record and we get the dividend. That's called the cum dividend date. Cum dividend means the stock is still trading with the dividend. On the next day, if we buy the stock on the next day, we don't get it. It is trading X dividend, which means it's trading without the dividend. So if we own the stock, all the way through and we decide to sell it on this date, guess what? We still get the dividend because we owned it on this date, we would still get the dividend. So just to keep it straight, let's say that the uh, dividend record date was a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, any of these days. If the uh, dividend record date was a Monday, the ex-dividend date was the Friday. Now this is assuming no holidays. Uh, if there was a holiday, then you back up one more day. It's one trading day. Uh, so if the dividend record date is a Tuesday, we back up to the Monday. If it was a Wednesday, you back up to the Tuesday. If it's a Thursday, you back up to the Wednesday, which means if you buy it on these days and this is the record date, you do not get the dividend. To get the dividend on a Monday, you must buy it on a Thursday. To get the dividend on a Tuesday, you must buy it on a Friday. And again, assuming that's not a holiday, if that's a holiday, you got to back that up to the Thursday. Well, we're still uh, uh, on the idea of common shares paying a dividend, but uh, we're, now we're going to look at uh, uh, the dividend reinvestment plan. It's shortened to a DRIP, dividend reinvestment plan, and typically spelled with a little i, DRIPS. Uh, rather than having the company pay you a cash dividend and you taking that cash dividend and buying more shares of the company, the company just says, oh, is that what you're going to do? Why don't we just give you the shares instead of the cash? Uh, so that when you get your dividend, you're actually getting it in the form of shares, uh, which is actually can be a very powerful thing if you plan on buying more shares of that company anyways. Uh, the reinvestment of the dividend saves on commissions. You don't have to actually go and buy those shares now. Uh, they're given to you, so you don't actually have to incur the commission of buying them. You dollar cost average, which means uh, every, every quarter you're going to buy shares at whatever the price is, which smooths out your pricing. Uh, and you get dividend compounding. You may get a dividend of $87 a quarter. Well, $87 might not be enough to go out and buy shares. The commission alone would just make it not worth it. So you might have to wait a year, year and a half, two years before you build up enough to buy more shares. Well, in the meantime, you're not getting dividends on your dividends. Whereas if you get shares, the next time there's a dividend being paid, you have your original shares, plus you have the shares that the dividend bought. So you're getting dividends on your dividends now. So you're, you're compounding at a faster rate. Uh, sometimes, depending on the drip that you get, the shares are also purchased at 3 to 5% below uh, the market price, below the average price of the stock five days prior to the payment date. So by getting the drip, you can save the commission, you get faster compounding, and you may get them at 3 to 5% below what you would pay if you got cash to go out and buy them. So you get them at a anywhere from a 3 to 5% discount. 3% is the most common discount. So you do actually get them cheaper by signing up for a DRIP. Now, not all companies offer DRIPs. If they offer DRIP, they have something called a transfer agent. You must contact the transfer agent, give them your account particulars, and they will then uh, do the purchasing for you. And what the transfer agent does is it has a whole bunch of people who want these DRIPs, and it... The company pays the transfer agent the dividend. The transfer agent then goes out in the market and buys all of these shares, and then it distributes them to everybody who wants the uh, uh, who who uh, uh, signed up for the drip. Sometimes your dividend might just be in the form of extra stock, a stock dividend where you have a payment uh, in shares instead. Uh, and finally, limited liability. The uh, all you can lose. Uh, with a uh, 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 with a share of common stock is what you paid for the common stock. 
You don't, you're not responsible for any losses further than what you put up. Let's look at stock splits. Stock splits are typically used to adjust the price of shares. If the price of shares gets too high or too low. So in the last three years, we've seen two companies, two very high profile companies do stock splits. Both Apple and Netflix did a seven for one stock split because their shares were seven, eight hundred dollars uh, per share. Well, you don't have a lot of buyers, especially retail buyers at seven, eight hundred dollars per share. To buy a hundred shares of Apple, you needed seventy thousand dollars. So you do a seven for one stock split, the stock price is now $100. So to buy 100 shares, you only need $10,000. It makes it more attractive to a wider base, uh, which adds more liquidity to the stock price. Uh, makes the shares more marketable, more liquid. So let's look at a two for one stock split. Let's say you have 100 shares, they're 50 bucks each. You own $5,000 worth of, of stock. If there's a two for one stock, stock split, post split, you'll have 200 shares. You go from 100 to 200, but the price goes from 50 to 25. The stock split moves the price. Even though you have more shares, it moves the price down. So the value of the company doesn't change. And look at this, the value of your holdings do not change. It just makes it more marketable. That's all. Splits do not change the total value of your position or the value of the company. Now, that being said, Here's what it does do. When there's a stock split from a very high price to a low price, the market will price in a premium on the shares because the argument is they are more liquid now. And since they're more liquid, that makes them a little bit more valuable as opposed to being uh, uh, priced so high that the market was small for it or that it wasn't as liquid or as marketable as it could be. So there is a liquidity premium that uh, on a stock split that does get added because more uh, uh, investors who were priced out of the stock could now come into the stock. A reverse stock split is the opposite of a stock split. It is used to raise the price of shares and it's usually done uh, when a stock price falls below some minimum listing requirement. For instance, New York Stock Exchange minimum listing is a dollar. Is a dollar. So if a stock price falls below a dollar and in the wake of the uh, 2008 uh, financial crisis, there were a few stocks, Citigroup and GM, that fell below the $1 mark. GM just decided to do a bankruptcy, so they disappeared. But Citigroup fell below the dollar. They were at risk of being delisted, uh, so they did a 10 for 1. Uh, no, sorry, Citigroup wasn't below a dollar. They were below $5, uh, which was the critical mark. Anything below $5, a lot of funds aren't interested in stocks below $5. So they did a 10 for 1 reverse stock split to bring their price back up into the $45, $50 range to make it more attractive. Usually done when the price falls below some minimum requirement. So let's say you have 100 shares that are selling at 97 cents. Uh, means you have $97 worth of stock. If they do a 10 for 1 reverse split to make the uh, stock price a little bit more attractive, you now only own 10 shares, but they're worth $9.70 each. Still worth $97. Let's look at some stock quotes here. Uh, for this one here, the stock is BEC. Uh, typically here, the, the types of information you'll find on a stock quote is the 52-week high and low. This is important uh, because it gives you a, a gauge of the momentum behind the stock. A stock that's trading near its 52-week uh, high still has a lot of positive support in the marketplace. Uh, one that's trading near its 52-week low is sort of out of favor. So it gives you a, a nice little eyeball on it to see where it is. This thing here, what did it close at? It closed at $10.35, so it's sitting near the bottom third of its 52-week range. Uh, it pays a 50-cent dividend, it, and this is the day's trading, where it says high and low, that's just for the day. For the day, it got as high as 10.65, as low as 10.25, and it closed at 10.35, just off the low. Uh, but uh, uh, still up 50 cents on the day, so the change is plus 50, and this is how many shares traded, uh, traded hands that day. That's the typical amount of information you're going to get off a stock quote. The day's high and low, typically the 52-week high and low, uh, um, the, uh, the, the closing price, the change for the day, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the volume. So let's look at preferred shares and some of the uh, uh, characteristics and defining features of preferred shares. It is equity. It's not considered debt. There are two types of capital a company can have, debt and equity. This is equity. Uh, uh, they are the owners of the company, much like common shareholders are the owners of the company. But preferred shares are typically less liquid and less marketable in the market than the company's common shares. And in fact, it's quite common 
that for uh, uh, most companies that do have preferred shares, uh, for there to be no trading volume in their shares sometimes for days on end. Uh, because they're not tradable shares, they're typically investable shares. The uh, types of investors who buy preferred shares are typically income-oriented investors that have a buy-and-hold uh, uh, policy on, uh, on their preferred shares because they don't have capital appreciation uh, a potential like common shares are, as we'll see. They have a fixed dividend. The dividend is stated as a percentage of par. Par on preferred shares is typically $25. Sometimes it's $50, but typically uh, when you hear the word preferred share, you can think, well, they sell. Preferred shares typically sell for around $25. That's their par value. Appeals to income investors because it has the low volatility that you would expect from debt prices, uh, whereas common shares have very high volatility, meaning their prices move around a lot. The preferred share uh, uh, doesn't really move around that much, has very low volatility, but it pays a regular stream of income uh, as a percentage of par, uh, but it's a dividend, not interest. So it is Canadian dividend tax credit eligible. If you receive a dollar in interest, there's no benefit to that. That's income, and you pay it at your marginal income, income tax rate. If you receive a dollar in, in Canadian dividends, there's a dividend tax credit for that. You pay a much lower tax rate for that. So uh, for income investors uh, that, uh, that want low volatility uh, on their portfolio holdings, I strongly recommend looking at preferred shares as a proxy instead of, uh, 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 instead of using debt or as much as debt. The dividend is still discretionary, though, so that is a bit of an issue. It's still discretionary. However, it may be cumulative if not paid. So if a company cancels the dividend on a preferred share for two years and then reinstates the dividend, when they reinstate it, all of those previous dividends they didn't pay are cumulative. They have to pay all of those back dividends before they even begin to start paying dividends to common shareholders. So they may be cumulative if not paid. And they price like bonds. They, don't, they, they won't move with the price, with the value of the company. They'll move with interest rates. Each successive round of a preferred share is called a series. So when you're looking at a company that has preferred shares, you might see Series A, Series B, and you might wonder, well, what's the difference between all of these? It's just when they were issued. Series B was issued after Series A was. That's all. However, in bankruptcy or liquidity, all preferred shareholders rank as one class. It's not that Series A gets paid out before Series B. They all rank as one class. Uh, and they rank ahead of common shareholders on any claims on assets, uh, only to the extent of their par value, though. So if their par value is 25, uh, much like a bond with a par value of 100, once you pay the bondholders out, then you move on to the uh, preferred shareholders. Once you pay them $25 per share, that's it. They don't, they don't get everything. They only get up to the extent of their par value. So a logical question would be if preferred shares... Uh, act like debt, uh, have a stated dividend rate as a percentage of par, uh, why, why issue preferred shares? Why not issue debt? Because here's the deal. Preferred shares, they're more expensive to issue. So why, why do it? Um, well, there's no maturity on uh, preferred shares, so there's no payback. You don't have to worry about paying, uh, paying back all that principal amount in five years or 10 years. Uh, dividends can be canceled on preferred shares. Uh, so they can be cancelled, so you have flexibility. Interest payments cannot be cancelled. Uh, it also improves the debt equity ratio. So if you already have a lot of debt uh, and you can't and raising more debt would have a higher interest rate or a lower credit rating and you need to raise the equity uh, you have in the business, selling, uh, selling preferred shares can do that. It improves the debt equity ratio without diluting common shareholders. That's a powerful thing. Uh, and you may not be able to issue debt. Uh, because you might have just too much debt and the market may not accept any more debt without a significant downgrade in credit or without significantly higher interest rates. So preferred is a natural place to go. Features, uh, cumulative versus non-cumulative. I've already alluded to this uh, in the previous screen. Cumulative means all missed dividends accumulate and must be paid before any common dividends. This is the most common form of preferred share. The most common form is cumulative. Uh, Non-cumulative would have to have a higher fixed dividend to compensate for the fact that if it were cancelled, you simply just lose them. So it's cheaper for a company to issue cumulative preferred shares uh, 
Uh, and if they have to cancel a dividend, oh well, they have to cancel the dividend when they have to start paying again. That's what they should have paid anyways. If it's non-cumulative, then their carrying costs of that preferred share are higher. Uh, preferred shares can be callable or non-callable. If they're callable, just like bonds, uh, so you can think of, 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 of what a callable bond is, and a preferred share would act the same way. Uh, or they can be non-callable. A preferred share that's non-callable is called a perpetual preferred share because up here, right, no maturity date to preferred shares. So if there's no maturity date and no call feature, that means those, those preferred shares can last forever. That's why they're called perpetual preferreds. Uh, they may also have a sinking or a purchase fund if they have a call feature or if they have some expiration. It's not, it, it's not an uncommon thing to issue a preferred share with a 10-year a, a uh, um, expiration where they'll be bought back in 10 years. That can happen. It's not the common way to do it. And if you were going to do it that way, you'd most likely use a debt issue unless, of course, you can't issue debt. Uh, and preferred shares are non-voting, except when there are issues that pertain particularly to the preferred shares, there may be a vote for the preferred shareholders. Let's look at the uh, topic of cash accounts. And uh, we all have cash accounts. I shouldn't say we all have cash accounts, but we're all very familiar with cash accounts, and at some point in our lives, we'll all bump up against a cash account. Uh, your TFSA and your RRSP, these are cash accounts. And cash accounts means you can't borrow uh, in these accounts. You can only buy what you have the money to buy. Uh, full payment for all sales on or before the settlement date. There are no short sales in a, a cash account because for a cash account uh, for short sales you need margin no short sales no forex highly leveraged uh, you'll need a margin account no derivatives or at least very limited derivatives uh, in a, a cash account and there are conditions under which you can use a derivative but very limited uh, examples of, of when you can do that a margin account non-registered account all registered accounts like the tfsa rsb they are uh, cash accounts only, non-registered accounts. You can margin. You have the ability to borrow uh, to purchase securities. And all asset classes are available in a margin account. When I say that they're available, it doesn't mean you automatically have them when you open a margin account. When you open a margin account, the first thing that you're, you're capable of doing is buying stock with borrowed money. But you may not be able to do Forex and you may not be able to do derivatives. It depends on your broker. Even if your broker has the ability to offer it to you, they may restrict you from doing it if they feel you don't have the experience. They have a duty of care to ensure that you have the experience. So, for instance, with interactive brokers, if you want uh, 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 to put derivatives on your account, uh, you have to affirm that you have so much experience. And um, there is the possibility that they can also give you a five or six question quiz. To, to actually test whether or not you know what you're doing. And if they feel that you don't, they won't let you. Isn't that interesting? Um, so all asset classes are available, but that doesn't mean they're available to everybody. Margin, this is an easy way to keep this straight. Margin starts with M, and so does me. Margin is me. Margin is the amount of funds the investor must put up. Margin is me. Margin loan is the broker. So remember that. Margin is me. They both start with M. The balance is borrowed. Interest is calculated daily and paid monthly. Let's look at some positions and make sure we understand the vocabulary of this industry. Long and short. A long, uh, a long position is a position that profits from a rise in price. A short position is a position that profits from a drop in price. So for a margin account, uh, the investor only makes a partial payment for securities. And there are different levels of, of uh, margin uh, depending on the type of security. So let's uh, look at uh, a long margin account. Uh, these are loan amounts. Uh, when I say long margin account, this is opposed to a short uh, margin account. In other words, we have a margin account and we're going to take a long position as opposed to a short position. There are different margin requirements for both. So let's look at the long position. We're going to buy stock. Uh, loan amounts are set by IROC. Remember, this is the uh, industry uh, regulatory body uh, for the finance industry. Loan amounts are set by IROC for their members, and it's regulated and enforced. And here are the uh, um, um, 
the the levels any stock over two dollars at two dollars and over uh, the maximum loan value is 50 percent that's the maximum uh, 175 to 199 is 40 percent 150 to 174 is 20 percent under uh, 150 no loan value you pretty much got to buy it all yourself some securities are eligible for reduced margin which means 70 percent of the market value so if it's a hundred dollar stock and it's eligible for reduced margin you only have to put up 30 bucks the broker will put up 70 bucks and uh, let's follow this asterisk down here that uh, these loan values are IROC maximums uh, many firms choose to set more stringent requirements for example many firms do not allow clients to take margin positions on stocks that trade under three dollars I use interactive brokers interactive brokers has no loan for stocks under two dollars if you buy a stock under two bucks you cannot margin it you got to pay for the whole thing yourself here it's saying 175 to 199 150 to 174 there are different maximums IB can clearly allow this to happen they just say no we don't want to now here's what IB can do they can make it harder in other words require me to put up more money but they cannot require me to put up less money than than the maximum loan value so if the maximum loan value is 50 percent and i got to put up 50 percent they cannot go to 70 percent or 80 percent and say i tell you what we know it's 50 but we're willing to lend more they can't exceed the maximum but they can make my margin requirement the money i got to put up they can make that even more stringent so i got to put up more they can go lower than the maximum on the loan value they just can't go higher uh, the select the, this uh, the uh, securities eligible for reduced margin selected IROC securities can be eligible uh, for only 30% margin if they're high liquidity low price volatility stocks so if you take these six Canadian banks there you go they are eligible for reduced margin so you can own the banks uh, for 30 cents on the dollar and margin the other 70 uh, on the loan all right let's uh, run through a, a quick example to see how this works Let's say that we want to buy a thousand shares of a stock that's trading at twenty-five dollars. We need twenty-five thousand dollars to get that done. Uh, our broker is willing to give us a maximum loan of up to fifty percent. So uh, the broker will lend us twelve five against a twenty-five. So the margin, who's the margin again? Me is the margin. So me puts up twelve thousand five hundred, uh, and we'll follow it uh, in two ways: the price going to twenty-two and the price going to twenty-nine. At twenty-two, the value of our holdings are only twenty-two thousand dollars. The maximum loan is 50% of the market value of the stock, so the maximum loan can only be $11,000 at this point. We borrowed twelve five, so the broker is going to say, "Hey, uh, buddy, you need to get this down. Uh, give me $1,500 to pay off this loan." So you'll send $1,500 in. It'll bring this loan down to $11,000. You're good. Uh, you started with an investment of twelve five. You've got another fifteen in, so you're $14,000 into this position already. If it goes to twenty nine. Uh, the new value of your holdings are twenty nine thousand, and since you're allowed fifty percent of the market value of your holdings, <clears throat> your maximum loan can be fourteen thousand five hundred. Well, you've only borrowed twelve five, so you can actually withdraw two thousand dollars out of your account. You have excess margin. If you withdraw that two thousand uh, dollars, the uh, broker then moves the loan up to fourteen five. So now you owe fourteen thousand. 500 you still only have 125 in but you owe even more money uh, than you own problem with doing this is if this starts to retrace even a little bit then you got to give that money back again uh, so excess margin typically should never be withdrawn and here's the thing about margin you should never ever in your account uh, uh, play at the extent of your margin in other words if your if your account is fully margined and there's no excess cash available any adverse moves uh, we'll start a cascade of, of margin calls. And margin calls have to be met the same day. It is virtually impossible to meet a margin call in the same day because you got to get money into that brokerage account. Well, you can't just walk in and hand in cash. You can't do that. No broker will take cash. It's got to go through the banking system, which means you got to transfer it from your bank account. That takes 24 hours. You're not going to meet the margin call by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So typically, margin calls are met with selling, uh, uh, that some of your holdings are sold, uh, such that uh, 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 the loan can be uh, uh, paid off to the level it needs to be paid off to. Uh, so anytime you have excess margin, it's always good. Uh, and if you do have excess margin, uh, you know it's it's strategically wise to keep it there. The risks of margin, well, it ma magnifies the gains on the upside, but it also magnifies the losses. Uh, interest and loan must be paid back regardless of profit or loss, and there is no delay in meeting a margin call. 
Uh, and if you can't meet a margin call, the account can be liquidated without your consent. If you do nothing, the broker has full permission to go into your account and just start selling stuff. Short selling. And this causes a, a, a lot of confusion uh, uh, with, uh, with students who've come across this, who've never heard of this before, or aren't quite sure how it's done. Um, it is the sale of securities you do not own. And that's the big stumbling block is how can I sell something I do not own? And we profit, of course, if the price goes down. So let's deal with profiting if the price goes down first. Let's say I sell something at $100 and I buy it back at $50. Well, I've made money, haven't I? Because when I sold it for $100, I put $100 in my pocket. And then to buy it back, I only paid $50 for it. So I've made money by short selling it. I felt the price was going to go down, and it did. So I think we get that idea. Um, the, the, the idea we don't get is, well, where did you get it to begin with? Well, listen, if I can borrow money from my broker to buy stocks to go long, why can I not borrow stocks from my broker to go short? And that's all it is. Instead of borrowing money to buy, we're borrowing shares from them. So when you look in your trading account and you see that you have 100 shares of IBM, ah, maybe you don't. Maybe he's taken those 100 shares and given them to somebody else to short sell them. Now, your account still says that you're the beneficial owner of 100 shares of IBM, and it's true, you are, but they might not actually be there anymore. Now, you're thinking, but isn't that odd? Think about it this way, and this will give you a good idea of what short selling is. A bank short sells money all the time. You go to a bank, and you deposit money into the bank, but so do a lot of other people deposit money into the bank. When you go back to the bank to get your $20, let's say you put 20 in, when you go back to get your $20 out, do you expect to get the same $20 bill that you gave them? No, you don't care what $20 bill you get. So out of this big pool of money that's sitting here, banks realize over a period of time, yeah, we're holding on to all this money, but not everybody comes the same day to get it. So we can easily lend some of this money out to someone else and then they can replace it. But when you come to take out your $20, it could be this person's $20 that you're taking out. The point is, of all the inventory of money they hold, uh, they can lend some of that out. Well, the broker's the same way. When you buy 100 shares of a stock, the broker holds the shares in their own name for you. The shares aren't held in your name. They're held in, and I'll do air quotes here, street name. So they'll have this big inventory of shares. But not everybody, everybody's holding them. Not everyone's selling them. So they say, well, if we have all these shares, we can easily lend some of these shares out to somebody to short sell, and then they can replace it later on. Uh, and when they short sell the shares, the money from the short sell goes to the broker who then earns interest on that money. It doesn't, the, the client who short sells the shares doesn't earn the interest, the broker earns the interest, and then the stock is replaced at some future point in time. So that when you come to withdraw your 100 shares, it could be somebody else's 100 shares. But again, do you care what $20 bill you get when you go to the bank? No. So here's how it works. Number one, the dealer lends shares to the investor. Number two, the investor sells those shares. And the money comes into the account, but notice I put a, a red box around it. The money shows up in the investor's account, but it's segregated. There's a line item showing that the investor has that money available to rebuy the shares, but it's the broker who's earning interest on this. Um, so the money has to sit here, plus the investor also has to put in more money called a margin. Uh, so even though you short sell and you get all the proceeds from the sale, the investor still has to put more money in that's called a margin. So the dealer might have up to 150% of the value of the shares that they're earning interest on. This money is restricted in your account. This money can only be used to buy the shares back. You can't buy anything else with it. You can buy back the shares and then return the shares to the broker. So let's go through uh, uh, an example here. Let's say you're going to short 100 shares and the price is uh, $500. P sub naught, P naught will refer to the price today. P naught, P sub capital T is the price at some future time. So P naught is $5. Um, so you short sell the shares. The margin on short sales is 150% of the value. So if you sell, uh, if you're shorting something that has $500, you have to make sure that you have $750 in your account. It breaks down like this. You're going to get $500 from the sale of the stock. That goes towards your margin. There's 100%. You got to put up the other 50%, so you put up 250. Your broker now has $750 that they're investing and earning interest on. 
previous to the short sale, they weren't earning any interest on, on those shares. So that's why a broker is motivated to lend you shares because they come up with money that they can earn interest on. So you put up 250 bucks. Let's say the stock rises to six bucks. Well, that's a bad thing, isn't it? If we own the stock at five, we want it to go to six, but we're short the stock at five, which means at some point we got to buy it back to replace it. If we sold it for five and then we got to pay six for it, that's not good. We'd like to buy it back at a lower amount. Let's say it went to six. If we shorted 100 shares at uh, six bucks, uh, we'd get $600. The margin is 150% on that, which means we need $900. Um, minus the proceeds from the short sale, because we originally sold them at 500, that means we need to have $400 in, but we only have 250. So we would have a margin call for $150. Do you get that? The, the broker is saying, well, now that it's six bucks, your total margin balance should be $900. Your total margin balance is only 750. Uh, we need another $150 to get it there. Uh, there are no time restrictions on a short sale. Uh, if the uh, share loan, the loan that the uh, uh, dealer gave you for the shares cannot be maintained, and here's a good reason why it cannot be maintained. Let's say that uh, there's a number of shares of IBM here that the dealer is holding, but then uh, the holders start selling the shares of IBM such that the dealer no longer has any inventory of IBM. Then he'll tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, those shares I lent you, buddy, I need them back. I need them back like right now. I need them back fierce. Well, then uh, uh, you got to go out and buy them. That's called a forced buy-in. Uh, the investor receives a forced buy-in demand. Risks of short selling, uh, the forced buy-in, having to buy them back right when you don't want to. You're liable for all dividends that the stock pays because if the shares are not here and the dividends come in, well, there's no shares here. Somebody somewhere is expecting their dividend. You've sold them, so you got to pay the dividend while you're short the shares. And there's potential unlimited loss. If you buy a stock at five bucks, it can only go to zero. If you short a stock at five bucks, it can go to six, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. It can keep going on the way up. There's no limit to how high it can go, but if you own it, it can only drop to zero. So know the risks. All right, one of the more interesting and exciting topics, I think, derivatives. What is a derivative? Let's start there. Uh, a derivative is a financial contract. Let's get that out of the way right off the top. And before we race on, let's just spend a second and make this distinction here. It is not a financial asset. Um, it can be described as a financial security, but it really isn't a financial security. It is best and most appropriately described as a financial contract. So it is a financial contract between two parties, a buyer and a seller, whose value is derived from the value of some other asset. Hence, you see the word derived, derivative, derived. And we refer to this other asset as the underlying asset. So it is a financial contract good example is you and I enter into an agreement for me to buy your car at some future time. I don't want to buy it today. I may or may not want to buy it in the future. But what I'll do is we'll agree on a price today at which I would buy it in the future if I chose to buy it in the future. So let's say we agree on $5,000. If in the future your car is worth more than $5,000, I'll exercise my option and buy that asset, that, that underlying asset. But let's be clear, what we have is a financial contract for the purchase of that underlying asset if I so choose to do so. So that's a, a sort of a good uh, example of one of the basic types of derivatives, which is an option. I just described an option where I have the right to do something. So there are two basic types of derivatives, options and futures and forwards. These are really the same thing, but we're going to see that it's just uh, in, in the way that they're sold. So there's really only two basic types. Common features to all derivatives. They are contractual agreements between two parties. Number one, all derivatives are financial contracts between two parties. They all have a price, a price at which some underlying asset will be exchanged. They have an expiration date. All options, all futures, all forwards uh, have some date in the future beyond which that contract ceases to exist. And all are a zero-sum game. And this is a little bit confusing, so I'll try to explain this. Uh, with derivatives, no wealth is created, only transferred. For me to make a dollar, somebody must lose a dollar. And it's, and it's in the architecture of the derivative itself. 
It is a financial contract between two parties, a buyer and a seller. So if the buyer makes money, the seller must lose money. So that no overall wealth in society is created with derivatives. Wealth is only transferred from one to another. And we're also going to uh, see that the big reason why we would engage in derivatives is not so much because we're interested in wealth transfer, but because we're interested in risk transfer. There are uh, two broad markets uh, uh, where derivatives are um, created and, uh, and, and closed. I don't say bought and sold, but created and closed because we really don't buy a derivative. We create one. They don't exist. We simply create one. And we never actually sell our derivative. We simply close our position. Uh, there is OTC, which is over the counter and exchange traded. Uh, OTC is a negotiated market, so I enter into a, a derivative contract with another party. I can negotiate all of the terms. If something is exchange traded, that's an auction market. These are standardized contracts. I don't have a choice in, in uh, what the terms are. They're just given. Uh, so contracts under OTC, contracts can be customized in terms of the asset, the underlying asset, the size of the contract, the expiration, whereas with exchange traded, they're standardized contracts with respect to the asset, the size of, of the asset in, that the contract handles, and the expiration. Uh, for OTC contracts, early exit may be difficult. The more you customize it, uh, the harder it is to get out of because it's hard to find somebody else that may want to take your position or it's hard to find another contract with the same terms that you can offset with. Uh, so usually results in delivery, uh, low liquidity. For exchange traded, very liquid contracts. Early exit is easy. Uh, to exit a derivative contract, you simply take an opposite position in another contract and they cancel each other out. So these rarely result in delivery of the underlying asset. Uh, for OTC, no reporting requirement. So a lot of privacy here. If I'm a big player and I want to make a big bet on something, I don't want the world knowing what I'm doing. Uh, whereas with exchange traded, all transactions are recorded and known. So if I'm a big player and I'm taking a big position in, in uh, some options, I'm going to leave footprints. And those footprints are available for the market to see. They see that somebody is taking either a bearish or a bullish position on something and it's a large position. Uh, that uh, it gives the market information I may not want them to know. Uh, for the OTC, the counterparty uh, is the other party. Uh, the buyer and the seller enter the contract together. you got to trust that if you win, that the other side pays off. So you have counterparty default risk. But in exchange-traded uh, um, um, derivatives, uh, there's something called a clearinghouse. The clearinghouse is the counterparty to all contracts. So if a buyer and seller uh, create a financial contract, the clearinghouse is the counterparty to both the buyer and the seller, so there's no default risk. And in Canada, it is the Canadian Derivatives Clearing Corporation that is the counterparty to all derivatives. Uh, because there's counterparty risk in OTC markets, typically large institutional and corporate customers only. So you as a retail uh, client can't just call up a, a, a dealer desk and say, I want uh, a customized derivative uh, of, of, of this particular thing. Nobody would take the other side because the other side has to say, well, look, is this, is this person even going to pay off? Uh, because they have full counterparty default risk. All right, continuing on with the uh, uh, difference between the two markets. Uh, OTC, no margin requirements. Uh, or very few margin requirements worth with exchange traded uh, margin requirements on both sides. Since the clearing uh, house is counterparty to both the buyer and the seller, from their perspective, they got risk on the buyer side and risk on the seller side of, of non payment. So uh, on opening uh, an exchange traded derivative contract, the clearing house says, okay, well, you, you both got to post margin just to make sure that you can meet your obligations. Uh, lightly or no regulation in OTC contracts, heavily regulated, heavily regulated on the exchange traded side. Now, this light or no regulation on OTC contracts, that is changing. Uh, uh, regulators are starting to eyeball that industry. By the way, the OTC market is far bigger than the exchange traded market in terms of the nominal amount of the underlying assets that are traded. Far bigger. Uh, uh, than the exchange traded one. There is some estimates that uh, worldwide the OTC derivative markets are somewhere north of $300 trillion. $300 trillion, that dwarfs what goes on on the exchange. Uh, so regulators are looking at this saying there is a destabilizing factor here for the economy. 
So what they're starting to do, and what they have done, I think, over the last, since the financial crisis, is they've, they've forced uh, dealers in the OTC market uh, to say, look, if you've got contracts that, are, that can be standardized uh, without any loss of value, do it and move it to the exchange, or at the very least require some margin to be posted. So that is, uh, this is, this is changing. So let's just put a pin in that and say, well, yeah, right now it's less regulated than exchange traded, but it's, uh, it's changing. Uh, mark to market. Um, this is a settlement uh, every day uh, for, we'll start with the mark to market here uh, on the exchange traded. If you're involved in the derivatives contract every day at a specific time, usually it's 2.30 in the afternoon, uh, a closing price is printed. And if you're on the winning side, you get paid that day from the losing side. If you're on the losing side, you must pay the other side that day. That's called daily settlement. You settle up the gains and losses every single day. Marked to market daily. Uh, in OTC, there is no mark-to-market daily, which means gains and losses can accrue all the way to the end of the expiration period. That's why there's huge counterparty risk, because if you had to settle up every day, then the most you could lose is just one day before the other person defaulted. But when you got to wait six months for your big payoff and the other side defaults, well, that hurts, right? Options can be uh, OTC and exchange traded. Forwards are uh, OTC and futures. This is an exchange traded forward. So when we talk about forwards and futures, the only difference between the two, a futures contract is a forward contract that is exchange traded. If it's not exchange traded, it's called a forward agreement, and that's all. All right, let's look at the types of underlying assets uh, that could be underlying a financial contract or a derivative. And there are two broad, uh, uh, broad sides to this. There's commodities that can underlie the contract or financial assets. So commodities can be broken up into two types of commodities, consumption commodities and investment commodities. I think we can make quick work of investment commodities. There are commodities that you hold um, for the sake of holding them, gold, silver, platinum, uh, because they have the potential to appreciate in price. So they are considered an investment. A consumption commodity... Uh, these are commodities that you would consume so that uh, you buy them and then they cease to exist. So we're really looking at a lot of hedging and a lot of speculation in this field. And there are, um, uh, I've listed here, five of the big categories uh, of consumption uh, commodities. Grains, uh, soybeans, corn, wheat, these are the three big ones. Uh, Canada is big on uh, soybean and wheat. I'm not really sure about corn. I know in Ontario, lots of corn. Uh, but as you get out into the uh, into the prairie provinces, wheat, soybean tend to be the big ones there. Livestock, cattle and hogs. Uh, so getting more into Alberta, uh, lots of cattle there. Uh, forest fiber and food, lumber, cotton, sugar. Uh, so Canada, softwood lumber, uh, we produce a lot of that. Uh, cotton and sugar, not so much. Metals, uh, copper, aluminum, gold, silver, palladium. Uh, now, even though gold, silver, platinum, these are investment assets, they also have industrial uses as well, especially silver and platinum and palladium. Uh, and then there's energy. This is the big one for Canada, oil, natural gas, electricity. Financial assets, these are equities, uh, so options on stocks, options on indexes, futures on indexes, uh, and interest rates. This is a big one in the OTC market is interest rates. Uh, if you're uh, on the exchange, if you're... Uh, um, if your underlying asset is an interest rate on the exchange, typically uh, you'll be uh, trading bond futures. Uh, however, in the OTC market, you'll trade the rate directly. You'll make a bet on the rate directly and not on the bond. So you'll use uh, 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 forward rate agreements and things like that. And they're typically based on LIBOR. Other financial assets are currencies, stock indices. Uh, these financial assets you'll find on the Montreal Exchange. Users of derivatives, uh, individual investors, uh, typically exchange traded only. Uh, and I'm, I say typically exchange traded only. There are certain individuals who are large enough, who are big enough, and have a, a, a good enough reputation that they can trade OTC if they want. But typically, they usually come from the industry. They're very well known, uh, and uh, uh, dealers are comfortable with them. But typically, uh, as an individual retail uh, investor or trader, you're exchange traded only. Mostly speculation, some risk management, uh, 
Uh, most people that uh, uh, do it, uh, if futures or options, tend to be on the speculation side, but it's a very powerful risk management tool. Requires a margin account and may require a test of knowledge or experience. Your broker may require this uh, if you're going to uh, uh, bring in options into your account or especially if you're doing futures or currencies. Uh, you will have to affirm that you have so many years of experience and uh, that may be enough, but some of them may also give you a test. Uh, institutional investors, uh, they can uh, use both exchange traded and OTC derivatives, again, speculation and risk management. So let's look at uh, some strategies that uh, institutional investors would use. And I think that you're going to start to see that uh, this is a pretty exciting, uh, a pretty exciting field uh, uh, to, to, to look at. Uh, market entry or exit. Let's say uh, you want 100 shares of ABC in three months, but you want today's price. So you know in three months that you're going to be getting an inflow of cash. Uh, and you're looking at the price of ABC said, and you're thinking, I wish I could own it now, but I'm not going to have the money for three months. I'd like to own it in three months, but I want to own it at today's price. Uh, well, ABC is trading for $40. So what you can do is you can create a fake, uh, 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 a fake share. It's called a synthetic share. You buy a $40 call option, which gives you the right to buy the stock at $40, and you sell a $40 put. Uh, selling a $40 put means if the price drops below 40, somebody gets to sell it to you for 40. Well, if you bought the stock and it dropped below 40, you still paid 40 bucks. If you bought the stock and it rises above 40, you still paid 40. This gives you both. If the stock goes up, you get to buy it for 40. If the stock goes down, you must pay 40. So the combination of these two options creates a synthetic long position. So if ABC goes from 40 to 45, the combination of these two will pay off five bucks. No matter which way ABC goes, you're gonna get the shares in three months. If ABC is less than $40, the shares will get put to you uh, at $40. You'll have to pay 40 bucks for the share because that's what you promised somebody. If ABC is greater than 40 bucks, you exercise the call and buy the shares for 40 because somebody promised you they would do that. Remember, a, a derivative is a contract, a financial contract between two parties. If you buy a call, somebody is agreeing to sell it to you for 40, you're agreeing to pay 40. If it's below 40, you just say, well, I don't you don't have to exercise that option. You could say, I'm not gonna buy it. Uh, and if you're selling the $40 put, uh, somebody somewhere, has the right to sell it to you. Now, because you sold it, you have the obligation to pay. The end result is that you buy ABC today for 40 bucks, and uh, when you buy the call, you have to pay out money called a premium. When you sell a put, you actually get money in called the premium. Well, the combination of these two makes this position zero dollars to enter. Zero dollars to enter, and this pays off as if you own the stock, and in three months, no matter what happens, you're going to own the stock. Isn't that powerful? Another way uh, to get into the market is to sell a three-month $50 put. Now, this means that you're giving somebody the right to sell you the stock for 50 bucks, and you have to pay them 50 bucks. And you argue, but it's only 40 bucks today. So if you sell a $50 put, you're going to get at least $10 for it because it's the stock is $40. Bucks, you're selling the $50 put. This is worth at least $10 bucks right away. So you're going to get $10. Bucks. In the future, you'll have to pay $50, but somebody gave you $10 to do that, which means you only have to put up $40 of your own, uh, of your own dollars. So getting into the market using options uh, gives you a way to move in even if you don't have the money today. All right, well, we looked at uh, how to get into a market. Let's say we want to get out now. Let's say we want to sell 100 shares of XYZ at 70 bucks on December 15th. Uh, well, um, let's say that we only paid $40 for these shares. Well, there's a $30 per share capital gain, 100 shares. I got a $3,000 capital gain. It's December 15th, which means I got to claim it uh, the very next year. Uh, if I could defer this sale, if I, if I could wait and hold off till January 2nd and make the sale then I don't have to pay tax on that for another full year. How can I do that and still get rid of it on December 15th? Because here's the deal. I don't want to wait till January 2nd. What if that drops from 70 bucks to 60 bucks? It's 70 bucks right now. I want that 70 bucks, but I want it to happen January 2nd. How can I get that 70 bucks, but only make it happen on, the, on January 2nd? 
Uh, I want to defer the sale to January to defer taxes. I will sell a one-month call at $50. I'll sell a one-month call at $50. What am I doing when I do this? I am granting somebody else the right to buy this stock from me for 50 bucks. I'm giving them the right to do that. And since I sold this call, I must deliver this stock for $50. And you're probably saying, but it's 70 bucks now. Why would you agree to take 50? Well, because I'm going to get at least $20 when I sell this call. So when I sell the one month call, I'm going to get, at, and I say at least $20, I'm going to get a little bit more because there's some time left. But I'm going to get at least 20 bucks. And then in January, since I sold the one month call in January, if the stock is still sitting above $50, it will be called away from me. I will get another $50 in January. 20 plus 50 equals 70. Now, the price of this stock from, from uh, uh, um, this date for one month can fall 70, 69, 60. It can fall all the way to 50 bucks. And I don't lose a single penny because this $20 that I sold it for, I get to keep it no matter what. So let's say the price of the stock falls from 70 all the way to $49. Well, then it won't be called away from me at $50. I won't get to sell it for $50, but I still get to keep that 20 bucks. But now it's $49 in, in January. I might say, you know what? For $49, I'll keep it. And then hopefully it'll bounce back up again. But I can sell, this is called deep in the money. I can sell a deep in the money call and I can defer my sale to some future time and reduce my price risk. Uh, I can use derivatives for yield enhancement. Uh, making more money on the stock I already own. Let's say I'm holding 100 shares of DEF at $50. DEF pays a dividend of, let's say, 3.5% or 4%. I can sell a $60 call three months out. DEF is $50. Right now, I can go three months out and say, well, if I sold a $60 call, let's go ahead and do that. I'll get some money today for selling this call. I'll make money by doing that. If DEF is below 60 bucks, I get to keep that money and I can do it again. So in three months, if DEF is at 55, I can then go another three months out and sell a $65 call and do it again, and again, and again, and again. If DEF is greater than 60 bucks, here's the risk now. If it's greater than 60 bucks, I will get paid 60 bucks a share. So it's 50 bucks right now. I'm holding it because I like the dividend. It gets to 60 bucks. Well, I'll get the 60 bucks. I'll get, I'll make another 10 bucks off the deal and I still get to keep the premium. Isn't that nice? So that, uh, this is, uh, you typically would do this uh, when you're holding shares of a stock that pays a dividend, but you don't think the price is going to go up uh, and you want to make some extra money. Now, here's the beautiful thing about the yield enhancement strategy. Inside an RRSP or a TFSA, you can do this. If you own the shares, and you sell a call on the shares, that's called a covered call. That, that use of derivatives is allowed in an RSP and a TFSA. As long as you own the underlying shares, you can sell calls against the position you own because you own them. And then finally, uh, um, uh, number three, arbitrage. Arbitrage is the riskless profit. This is, a, um, I'll try to give you a nice example of a riskless profit. Let's say you're looking at the uh, London Stock Exchange and you're seeing gold uh, trading at $1,200 an ounce. And you look at the New York Stock Exchange and you see, uh, or the New York Mercantile Exchange, sorry, and you see gold trading at uh, $1,210 an ounce. Uh, well, it's cheap in London and it's expensive in New York. So you can go, you can uh, execute a trade on London to buy gold for $1,200 an ounce and immediately sell it in New York for $1,210 an ounce. Uh, thereby making $10 an ounce on the spread. And you would do that for as long as that spread remained open. But the buying in London would push the price up and the selling in New York would push the price down until both prices were the same. All right, a couple more users here, corporations and businesses. Typically OTC, uh, usually for managing unwanted risk. Uh, corporations aren't in the business uh, of speculating on an exchange or speculating uh, uh, on derivatives. They use it pretty much to manage unwanted risk, not to manage all risk. There's amount of, there's, corporations are in business uh, and, and there's a certain amount of risk involved in being in a certain line of business and they accept that risk. What they use hedging for is to get rid of all of the other risk they didn't agree to. Foreign exchange risk, this is for exporters and importers. Commodity prices, miners and farmers. 
that produce a lot of commodities that uh, that want to lock in a price so that they know what their uh, what the revenue is for the season. Interest rates, especially for borrowers, let's lock that in. And finally, you have derivatives dealers because, uh, well, and this is primarily OTC, because in the OTC market, uh, a corporation may want to enter into a contract that a dealer would be the counterparty to, whereas the dealer would say, well, we'll take the other side of that. Uh, may act as principal or agent. In Canada, primarily the six, uh, the big six banks are, uh, are derivatives dealers. All right, let's uh, dive into options here. Let's start by defining them. Uh, we have, uh, under options, there are two types. There are calls and there are puts. A call, and we'll read across the top, a call is a right to buy a specified asset at a specified price by a specified date. A put is a right to sell a specified asset at a specified price by a specified date. The asset, the specified asset is referred to as the underlying asset. The uh, specified price is referred to as the strike price. Uh, for an exchange, the strike price is preset. There are preset strike prices. You just choose the one you want. And OTC, strike prices are negotiated. And by a specific date, which is referred to as the expiration date. On an exchange, expiration dates are fixed per contract. OTC, they are variable. You can negotiate the exact date. Um, when I talk about a call and a put being a right, here I have the word right. They are a right to buy and a right to sell. That is if we're buying a call and if we're buying a put. Uh, now, a derivative is a financial contract between two parties. So if I'm buying a call, and I'm entering into a derivative, which is a financial contract, there must be somebody on the other side that is selling me the call. Well, we both can't have the right. If I have the right to buy, the other side must have the obligation to sell. Because if they have the right to sell, and I choose to exercise my right to buy, and they choose not to exercise their right to sell, how does the contract get settled? So in every contract, there are two parties. One will have a right to do something with options. One will have the right to do something. The other must have the obligation. If I'm buying a call and I'm buying a put, I buy a right. If I'm selling a call and I'm selling a put, I'm selling an obligation. I must perform. Uh, the trading unit of the options, uh, if we're talking about stock, if there are options on stock, every one option is for 100 shares. It's not that one, one call is for one share. One call option is for 100 shares. One put option is for 100 shares. If it's an option on currencies, uh, every option is for $10,000 of the underlying currency. If it's an option on futures, now a futures contract is a derivative. But you can have a derivative on a derivative, an option on a futures contract. Uh, and each futures contract will be, the underlying will be one contract. This is the big one. The, typically, when we talk about options, we're talking about stock options, buying options on, on, uh, on 100 shares. One options contract, 100 shares. And it is expressed as follows. This is how we read a, an option. This is the quantity. So here, what we're talking about is 15 IBM October $200 calls. Uh, so we usually have the quantity. You'll specify what stock is underlying the option. These are IBM stock options. You specify the expiration month. These are October uh, options. You specify the strike price. They're October $200 calls. So when I see this written, I know exactly what's going on. Somebody is long 15 October $200 calls on IBM. Let's talk about the option premium. Uh, the easiest way uh, to describe an option premium is to describe your car insurance. You pay an insurance company a premium. Every month you give them money. That's called the premium. And for that uh, a premium, you have the right to submit a claim. You don't have the obligation to submit a claim. There have been many times where uh, you can probably think of, of people or, or know people that have gotten into a small accident uh, where it's uh, just around their deductible or just under their deductible. And they say, well, you know what, I'm not going to report this because my rates are just going to go up. I'll just pay it myself uh, just to avoid uh, the rates going up. So you don't have to report it. Uh, you have the obligation, sorry, you have the right to submit a claim. But once you submit a claim, the insurance company has the obligation 
to honor their contract. So insurance is an option, isn't it? It's an option on a repair on your vehicle. You pay a premium to the insurance company. The insurance company sells you the insurance contracts. You're the buyer. They're the seller. You can think of that as a derivative. Uh, it is an option on a future repair. So if you're a buyer of a call or a buyer of a put, you pay money. The amount the buyer pays to the seller for the right. Now, if you're a seller of a call or a seller of a put, you make money. You're basically selling price insurance to everybody out there. Yeah, I'll insure that stock's price, and I'll insure that one, and you'll pay me premiums as long as you can pay for it if you're wrong. So we buy a stock. There are two positions. We can be long and hope the price goes up, or we can be short and hope the price goes down. With options, there are four positions. So let's go through them. There are two different types of options. There's a call and a put. And with each of them, you can either be a buyer or a seller. So we can buy a call or we can sell a call. We can buy a put or we can sell a put. And those are four different positions. So if we buy a call, we, we are long a call. If we sell the call, we are short a call. If we buy a put, we are long a put. And if we sell a put, we're short a put. If we're long a call, that's bullish. We're betting that the price goes up. That's a bullish bet to make to buy a call. If we buy a put, that's a long put, we are bearish. We're betting that the price goes down. If we short a call, in other words, we're selling a call, what we're saying is we're betting that the price is not going up. That's called not bullish. So we're neutral. We don't care if we draw out a price chart, and let's say that we sold a call here, and the price of the stock is here. We don't care if it does this. We don't care how it acts in here as long as it doesn't do this. That's all we're saying when we sell a call is, look, the stock can do anything it wants down here. I don't care. It just can't go over this price. In other words, I am not bullish. That doesn't mean I'm bearish. It doesn't mean I think the, the prices are going down. If I sell a call on a stock, all I'm saying is, yeah, the stock can do what it wants. I just don't think it gets above this price. That's all I'm saying. Well, that's all that bet is saying is that, is that the short call is a not bullish bet. And the short put, well, that would make sense. It's a not bearish bet. A call is bullish. Selling a call is not bullish. A put is bearish. Selling a put is not bearish. Look at option styles. Um, and I don't want you to um, get confused with these uh, names to think that it's geographically based. But there are American versus European options. Now, the American versus European has nothing to do with American options are traded in, in the U.S. and European options are traded in Europe. It has nothing to do with that. So let's just clear that off right now. I want to stress that. The difference is this. American options can be exercised at any time. So I have an option that expires in three months. I don't have to wait three months to exercise the option. If I want to call the stock away from somebody else, if I'm long a call and I want to call it now, I can do it now. I can exercise at any time. That's called an American style option. All exchange traded options, or sorry, all exchange traded stock options are American options. A European option, on the other hand, says, no, 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 you can't exercise any time. You can only exercise on the last day, on the expiration date. That's the only time you can exercise. You can trade these any time. You can trade American and European options all day long, any day. You can only exercise European options on the last day. American is any time exercise. Now, European uh, call options, most index options, if you have an option on a stock index, it is most likely going to be European. If you have an option on a stock, it is most likely going to be American. Let's look at LEAPS, L-E-A-P-S. Now, this stands for Long-Term Equity Anticipation Security. These are just really uh, long-dated options, uh, typically greater than a year. So you're buying a call option with an expiration of maybe a year, year and a half in the future. They typically have January expirations. An opening transaction for an option, if you're long, you buy a call or buy a put. If you're short, you sell the call or sell the put, and the buyer pays the seller a premium. For a closing transaction, uh, if it's exchange traded, you just reverse the opening transaction. So if I was, if I bought a call and I want to get out of it, all I have to do is sell a call. 
with the same strike price and the same expiration month. So let's say that I was long, uh, let's say a January uh, $20 call. Uh, and uh, uh, as we're getting close to January, I think, well, I no longer want to be in this call. I'm making money on it. I'd like the profit now. All I have to do to get out is I, I just have to sell a January uh, $20 call. Now, when I sell the January $20 call, here's the funny thing. I'm entering into a brand new contract. I'm not closing the existing contract. So I'm long this contract. And the counterparty is the clearing corporation. When I sell this, I am, I, I, I'm on this side of the contract. The other side is a clearing corporation. Now, the clearing corporation says, well, hang on a second now. He is long on one side of a contract we have with him, and he's short on another side of a contract we have with him. They will consider these two offsetting, and your position is zero. But until these expire, you are technically a counterparty to two options. So the so you're not selling your existing option. You're you this this one here still exists when you sell this one. You now have two, but since the clearing corporation is counterparty to both, they see that you offset each other. They will consider you closed. In other words, you have no further obligation. However, in the books with the clearing corporation, these two contracts still exist until the date of expiration, even though you have no further obligation. Uh, so you just reverse the opening the transaction. It's called offsetting. So for example, you're long a call. Uh, you close by selling a call. Not so easy uh, with OTC uh, uh, derivatives. Well, continuing on with closing transactions, we've already seen that we can simply just reverse the original transaction we had and we're considered flat. We have no position. The other thing that we can do uh, um, in terms of a closing transaction is to exercise the option. That means we're either going to take delivery or make delivery. If we're long a call uh, and we want to call the stock away from someone uh, from the other side, we will take delivery. If we're short, uh, sorry, if we're long a put uh, and the price has dropped and we want to put it to the other side at the, at the strike price, we will make delivery. So take or make delivery. And this is a long only decision, which means you're either long the call or you're long the put. You either bought the call or you bought the put. If you sold the call or you sold the put, this is not really your decision to make. You have an obligation to perform if the other side decides to exercise. But to exercise the option, you must have the right. Only those, only buyers have the right. Finally, number three, you can let the option expire worthless. If you bought a call uh, with a $60 strike price and the stock is $55, you'd never, you'd never call it away from somebody else and pay $60 for something you can buy in the open market at 55. You'd never do that. The option would have no value at that point, in which case uh, there's really no value or, or no point even in closing uh, the existing contract. Just let it expire. And that's the thing with options is, is if they're worthless, uh, you don't have to go through the expense of closing them. They'll just expire worthless. Uh, let's look at something called moneyness. And I know it's a funny word, but that's really what it's referred to as the moneyness of an option. Uh, and for here, we're going to need some terminology. ATM, OTM, and ITM. ATM means at the money. OTM means out of the money. And ITM means in the money. So we describe options as being at the money, in the money, or out of the money. And here's how it works. Let's say there's a stock price uh, that's $50. And I've just written it in blue here. There's the price of the stock. All right. And let's say we buy a $50 call. If we buy a $50 call while the stock is trading at $50, we say we have an at-the-money call, an at-the-money call. If the stock price then rises above this $50 strike price, that 50 stays, that, that's the price we agree that we can buy the stock at. That never changes. If the stock price rises above 50 to, let's say, $60, we say that our option is in the money. We say it's in the money because... We can call away a stock that's trading at, let's say, $60, and we only have to pay $50 for it. We've locked in that price. Once it's delivered to us for $50, we can immediately sell it in the market for $60, which means we're in the money. We're in the money, right? Um, if the stock price drops to like $45, uh, then it's not worth paying $50 for something that's selling for $45. We say that the option is out of the money. And that's for a call. If we buy a put, it's the other way around. If we buy a put, that means we get to sell it to somebody for $50. Well, that only has value if the stock price is lower, let's say $40. 
So rather than selling it in the market for $40, we know we can sell it for $50. So to exercise this put, what we can do is we can buy the stock for $40 in the market and immediately force someone to pay us $50 for it. So it's in the money on the downside, but if the stock price rises, it's out of the money. Notice that these are opposite, and it must be because a call and a put are opposite bets. So if we buy a call and this is in the money, it must be out of the money for the put. And if we buy a call and this is out of the money for the call, this must be in the money for the put. So being that we can talk about an option being in the money, let's break that down now uh, and, and determine uh, how, we, how we can look at the value of an option. The value of an option, the intrinsic value of an option is the in the money portion. So again, uh, S0, we're going to say is the stock price. X is the strike price of whatever our option was. So the in the money portion is whatever the stock price is minus whatever the strike price is. If it's for a put, it'll be the strike price minus the stock price. Here it'll be the stock price minus the strike price for the call. Uh, time value is whatever premium we do pay for the option minus the intrinsic value. All right, so if we buy a call on a stock, with a $50 strike price and the call is selling for 6 uh, sorry and the stock is selling for 60 bucks that option is $10 in the money that means it has $10 of intrinsic value but if there's time left on the option there'll be some value added for time value so it'll be worth more than just the $10 so the premium minus the intrinsic value will give us time value therefore the premium the price we pay for an option is a combination of both intrinsic value <clears throat> and time value. So let me give you an example here. Let's say the stock price uh, of a stock we observe is $50. And we want to buy a $45 call and the price of the call is $7. Here's how it breaks down. $5 of that $7 is intrinsic value because the call is at 45, the stock's already at 50, so the call is already worth 5 bucks. So you're not going to get it any cheaper than five bucks. You're going to pay at least five bucks. But we paid seven. So the other two dollars is for time value. This is because there's more time left before the option expires. We, buy, we pay for that time. If the stock price is $50 and we buy a $50 call for $2, the full $2 is time value. There is no intrinsic value because they're equal. And same if we buy a call out of the money, a $55 call when the stock price is 50 there is no intrinsic value here, so the value of the option, if we pay a dollar, it's all time value. So you're going to pay some time value, and you're going to pay at least intrinsic value. And time value depends on, well, let's say expiration is over here and you're here. Uh, you will pay more for time value than if you bought it here, because there's less time. And as each day goes by, the time value component drifts away. It, and there's a specific word in options trading we use for that. It's called decay. The time value component decays every single day. Well, let's look at uh, some strategies uh, for some options here, and we'll set up a, a scenario. Let's say that uh, we're in June. We're looking at XYZ, and the price of XYZ is 52.50. And we're looking at uh, some calls, and we're looking at some puts. And to make it interesting, we'll look at two different months, a September and a December on both and different strike prices, a 50 and a 55 on both. So let's just have a look at, uh, at our uh, uh, options first in relation to the price. The price is 52.50. So this September call is at $50, which means we get to buy it for $50 if we own this call. If the stock's at 52.50, clearly it already has value, right? The premium is 455. This premium is made up of both intrinsic value and time value. How much is the intrinsic value here? Well, it's the in the money portion. It's already in the money by 250. So, we're, how much are we paying for time? If we're paying 250 for intrinsic value, time must be 205. Uh, for the December call, it's a $55 strike. Uh, the stock is only 5250. So, this strike is out of the money. Since it's out of the money, it has no intrinsic value. It only has time value, and we're paying two dollars for that time. We look at the put. The September put is 50 dollars. Well, the stock price is above the 50. Now, remember with the puts, uh, we get to sell it to someone else for 50. Well, we wouldn't sell it for 50 if we can sell it in the market for 5250, right? So that has no intrinsic value at all. It only has time value, uh, $1.50. Look at the December 55 put. Well, we can sell it to someone for 55. 
it's selling for 5250 we will always sell it for 55 instead of 5250 which means it's two dollars and fifty cents in the money we're going to pay 485 for that put and if we're paying 250 for intrinsic value we must be paying two dollars and 35 cents for time value great let's try out some strategies now let's buy a call and when we buy a call it will just do a call purely on speculation and we'll buy five XYZ December 55 calls. So you remember how to read these, right? The stock XYZ, the expiration month is December, the strike is 55, and the option type is a call. We're going to buy five XYZ December 55 calls. Let's find them. Here's the calls. Here's December. Here's the 55. They're $2 each. And remember now, uh, all options are for 100 shares. The price that we're quoted on the option is per share. So this is $2 per share. This is $150 per share. To get the full price of the option contract, we multiply it by 100. So it's $2 times 100. That's how much we'll pay per contract. And we're doing five contracts. So we'll pay $1,000 today. In December, if the price of the stock is below $55, we will not exercise. We have a $1,000 loss. We would not, we would not elect to buy a stock for $55 if we can buy it in the marketplace cheaper. So uh, if it ends up less than $55 by December, our bet was wrong, we lose it all. If the price of the stock is greater than $55 in December, we will exercise. And we will exercise because anything over $55 has value. Now, well, I'll get to this $2 business in a minute, but let's just think, what if it's $55.10? Should we exercise it? Well, you ask yourself this question. Uh, would I pay $55 for something that is selling in the marketplace for $55.10? Well, I would. Even if I don't want it, I would buy it for $55 and immediately sell it for $55.10. Now, some of you out there may be saying, but you spent $2. You're going to lose money. Isn't, wouldn't you only exercise if it's above $57? Well, no, I wouldn't. Because even at 55.10, if I exercise, I'm going to make some money. I've already spent the $1,000 on the option. There's nothing I can do about that. I've already spent the $1,000. So anything over 55, I'll at least recover some of that money. My break even is $57. So if it's $57 and I exercise, I will make $1,000 on this transaction. But it cost me $1,000, which means I break even. Anything below 55, it's a pure $1,000 loss. Anything between 55 and 57, I will lose money, but I will lose less and less money until I hit 57, where I lose nothing. Anything above 57, now I'm making money. So, if the stock price is 50 bucks, I have 100% loss. 100% loss. If the stock price is $60, I will have a $2,500 gain on the shares. $5. Uh, and, but I have uh, uh, um, five option contracts. Five times 500 is 2,500. Less the thousand dollars that it cost me, I'll have $1,500 profit. But I only spent a thousand dollars to get that. So $1,500 divided by the original investment is 150% gain. I want to point this out now. 100% loss, 150% gain. Those are some big numbers. Now this is what people point to when they say options are risky. You could lose it all. Yes, you can. You can lose it all. You can lose 100% of your money. But we only put up $1,000. Let's say that we bought 500 shares. Let's say that we bought 500 shares of, of, of this stock at 5250. And let's say that by December it was $50. How much did we lose? We lost $1,250. But we didn't lose 100% of our money. We lost $1,250. Here we lost only $1,000. But we lost 100% of our money. You see, that's the wrong thing to look at. The percent is the wrong thing to look at. Here, we spent $1,000. What's the most we can lose? No matter what happens, what's the most we can lose? $1,000. That's it. So spending $1,000 on these calls is the same thing as buying this stock for $52.50 and putting a $50.50 stop loss order in. If you put a $50.50 stop loss order in, the most you can lose is 1000 If you buy five calls, the most you can lose is 1000 But if you buy 500 shares at $52.50, you're going to be putting up $26,250 instead of $1,000. So options 
uh, when you look at them the right way, are no more riskier than buying the stock. And in fact, options can be less riskier than buying the stock. I buy these options for $1,000. That's my maximum loss. I buy 500 of these shares for $26,250. I have to put a stop loss at $50.50 just to have the same situation as buying the calls. If it drops further than that, well, owning the shares was a worse deal. It was actually riskier in terms of the quantity of money I lose, not the percentage of money, but the quantity of money. Well, I'm concerned about the quantity of money. I'm not really concerned about the percentage that I earn or that I lose. All right, so just to sum up what we did, we bought that call and I said, uh, I, I compared it to buying the share. So consider, uh, if we buy 500 shares at 52.50 and put a stop at 50.50, our maximum loss is $1,000. Uh, well, our maximum loss with $1,000 with the calls as well. If by December, the stock price is $60, what is our gain if we bought the shares at 52.50? Well, we actually get $7.50. We actually don't have to worry about a break even. Our break even is 52.50. Times five is 37.50 versus 1,500. So by buying the calls, the stock goes to 60 bucks, we make 1,500, but if we bought the stock, we'd make 37.50. And if we bought the stock and put a 50-50 stop loss on, the most we would lose is 1,000, same with the stock option. So now you're probably thinking, well, hang on a second. Shouldn't I buy the stock, put a stop loss in, and make the bigger dollars if it goes up? I'd still have the same loss either side, but I'll always make more with, the, op, with the, the underlying stock rather than the options. Well, that's true, you will. But the investment required to buy 500 shares at 52.50 is 13,125 if we're going to use margin. If you're going to use margin, well, we only have to put up 50%. We made 37.50 off the 13,125, that's 28.57 ROI versus 150% ROI if you're using the options. And again, I'm not really concerned about the ROI. I am concerned about, about the maximum, about the quantity of dollars that I can lose or that I can win. Here, the, uh, with options, the quantity that you can lose is 1,000. Doing the stop loss, the quantity you can lose is 1,000. On the upside, you can make a lot more by owning the underlying shares than you can if you own the options. Another thing in favor of the shares, they don't expire. If by December uh, our options haven't worked, it's over. That's it, it's over. Uh, but if by December our shares haven't worked out, it's not over. Now if the shares pay a dividend, now we get paid to wait. So even though sometimes options may seem uh, uh, like they draw you in a bit going, well that's a lot better, 150% return versus 28.57, you have to look at the risks involved as well. This 150% has to happen in a particular time window or it's over. The shares, that don't have to happen in a particular time window. If I'm long some calls, I don't get dividends. If I'm long the shares, I get dividends. All right, uh, buying a call. And here, we're in, uh, what we did in number one is we speculated, now we're just gonna manage risk. Let's say we want 50,000 shares uh, of XYZ in December. We can buy $555 calls. Why 500? Well, because each one's worth, uh, we get 100 shares with each contract. If we buy 500 options, that's the same as 50,000 shares. So we can buy $555 December calls. If the stock price is greater than $55 in December, we will exercise and pay $55. Our average price is 57 because each call, remember, was two bucks. So our average price is 57, we have the shares. If the stock price is less than $55, we will buy the stock in the market and our average price will be whatever we paid plus two bucks. In other words, we can lock in a price now uh, at $55 and it'll only cost us $2 to lock in that price. And this way here, we're guaranteed to get that 50,000 shares uh, in, uh, uh, in December. We can also buy a call to protect a short sale. Remember, if we're short a stock, we don't want it to go up. But what if we shorted a stock and bought a call at the same time? So let's sell 100 shares of XYZ at 52.50 and we'll buy one $55 December call. So now no matter how high uh, XYZ goes, we sleep at night. 
Why? Because our call is making up the difference. Our call will make money as our short position is losing money. So now what is the most we can lose? $52.50 to $55 on the short sale because we don't actually start getting protection till the $55 mark. We'll lose $250 on the short sale. Plus we paid two bucks for the option. So the most we can lose on this deal is 450 bucks. That's the most we can lose at this point. What is our break even? If the stock price falls to $50.50, we'll make our $2 back that we paid for the, uh, the call. And anything below 50.50 is our profit. So now we have a maximum loss on our position of 450 bucks, but we have, uh, this can keep dropping and dropping and we can keep making money. So we don't cap our gains, but we do cap our losses. So it's kind of like putting a stop loss in, except instead of a stop loss knocking us out, we have an option that even if the price goes up, the option's gonna make money. Now I wanna point this out, uh, the difference between using the stop loss and using the call. So let me draw a little price chart. Let's say this is $55. There's the strike price. And let's say that we put, uh, we have a 450. Let's say we put a 450 stop loss on 5250. That would bring us to 57. And let's say that's 57. And let's say that this is the expiration date of the option way out here. Here is uh, a stop loss. Let's say that the stock price goes up. That's bad, that's bad. It hits 57, it knocks us out. We have a $450 loss if we use a stop loss. And then the stock drops. Well, too bad, we don't get to participate in that because we got knocked out. But if we had the call, as it goes up, we're not, we're not panicking. We're not in a panic saying, oh my God, I've got to cover it. Why? The call covers us. No matter what happens, the most we're gonna lose is 450. So we can do this, we can ride some, some uh, short-term uh, price movement against us, as long as by December it starts falling, it allows us to stay in the position longer uh, without heart attacks on a daily basis. Okay, we've covered off some strategies for buying calls. Let's, uh, let's sell some calls. Number three, let's uh, do a, a risk management strategy. We're going to do a covered call, covered call writing. We own 1,000 shares of XYZ, and uh, we bought them uh, way back at $40 a share. They're currently at $52.50. Uh, we're going to sell 10 September $50 calls, uh, and we're going to get $4,550. Why? Because the September calls are $455 each. We own 1,000 shares, so divide that by 100 means we need 10 contracts. So 10 times uh, um, $4.55 times 100 shares. We will make $4,550 today. Now what we do when we sell the $50 call is we're saying, look, uh, we'll sell you these shares for $50 and you're going to pay us uh, $4.55 today for the right to do it. The stock's only selling for $52.50. In essence, we basically sold the shares today for $54.55. If the stock price is above $50 in September, we'll get $50 a share. Our average selling price was $54.55. We locked in a price of $54.55 when the market price was only 52.50. So we did better than the market. If the stock price is less than $50, well, we get to keep the stock. We only paid 40, we'll keep the stock, but we also get to keep the 4,550 bucks. So we can take that 4,550 bucks that we got for free, basically, because we still own the stock. We haven't lost anything. We own the stock, we have the 4,550. We can take that and buy more of the stock and then go out another three months and do it again. And you can keep doing that and use the premium to keep buying more of the stock. Now this $4,550, you're probably thinking, yeah, but you gotta pay tax on that, don't you? Ah, no you don't, no you don't. It's not free, but you don't have to pay tax. What does this premium do? It actually lowers your average cost base. So if we get to keep the $4.55 per share, uh, we didn't pay $40 for this stock anymore, we paid $35.55 for the stock, so if we do it again and we get to keep the premium, we lower our average cost base each time. So that when we do finally sell, the whole difference is a capital gain. So we're taking this, which would normally be considered income, and we're smuggling it into the price of the stock and converting it into a capital gain down the road. That's the beautiful thing about a covered call, is you can take a high taxable income uh, like premiums from an option and turn it into a capital gain if you're using a covered call. Naked call writing. This means you don't own the shares. That's speculation. 
when you sell a call and you don't own the underlying shares, what you're saying is, I don't think the stock is going up past this price. We do not own any underlying stock, so we're going to sell the, the, uh, the September $50 calls, and we're going to get $4,550 today. Now, it's already in the money, but we're getting paid for it. We're getting paid for that. We think it's at $52.50. We think the stock is going to fall. Otherwise, we wouldn't sell the $50 call. We might sell a higher call. But we think the stock is going to retrace and come back under $50 by September, so we sell it. We don't want to short it. We don't want to do that. But we, we are comfortable selling the call, so we sell the call. If the stock does finish under 50 bucks in September, we keep the whole amount. We didn't, we didn't do anything. All we did was just said, I don't think it's, it's going to stay over $50, and we made $4,550. Um, if it's over $50, here's the bad news. If, you think, if you're looking at this going, that's good news. Well, yeah, it's good news. Here's the bad news, and it's, 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 it's more bad than the good is good. The most you can make is forty-five fifty. The most you can lose, unlimited. If the stock uh, is above fifty, we lose a thousand dollars because we sold ten. We lose a thousand dollars for every one dollar increase. So if the stock goes from fifty-two fifty to fifty-three fifty, there goes a thousand bucks. If it goes to fifty-four fifty, there goes a thousand bucks. In fact, it can rise to fifty-four forty-five, and we'd break even. Anything above fifty-four forty-five. We lose $1,000 for every dollar. There is no limit on that. It could go to 60, 65, 70, 75. Naked call selling uh, and, and uh, naked put selling are very risky things to do. Okay, let's move away from calls and let's look at puts. Let's buy puts. And we'll buy puts on speculation. We're going to buy 10 XYZ September 50 puts which is kind of like the same thing we were doing when we sold a call at 50 bucks, but now we're going to make a bet that the stock price is going down. Not just coming back under 50, but going down. We're going to pay a buck 50 for this. We're buying 10, uh, which means each contract is $150. We're going to spend $1,500. If the stock is above 50 bucks uh, by expiration, we lose 1,500 bucks. That's the most we can lose is 15. Now, you see the difference between selling the call and buying the put? We sell the call, the most we can lose is unlimited. If we buy the puts, the most we can lose is $1,500. That's the most we can lose. If the price is below $50, we make $1,000 for every $1. The most we can make when we sell the call is $45.50, but here, you can make much more if it continues to drop. We make $1,000 for every $1 drop. We break even at $48.50. So if it drops all the way to $40, we make $8,500. If it drops to 30, we make $18,500. In this scenario up here, when we sold the call, the most we can make is $45.50, but our loss is not capped. When we buy the puts, our loss is capped, but our gains are not capped. All right, let's buy these puts again, but this time we're going to do it uh, with risk management in mind. Let's say that we own 1,000 shares of XYZ. Uh, and let's say that we own them at $40. I have the $40 written here. Don't worry about the rest. I'll explain that in a second. But let's say we bought them at $40. We know they're currently at $52.50. We're worried about some downside softness in the market. Uh, so rather than put a stop loss in at, uh, at $50 and say, well, I'm out at $50, what we're going to do is we're just going to buy some puts at $50 and protect ourselves down there. So we're going to buy 10 XYZ September $50 puts. We're going to pay $1,500 for that. Well, there are two scenarios, right? The stock price can finish above $50. Uh, the average cost base, the ACB, the average cost base of the shares increased by $1.50. Uh, if the price of the stock is below $50, bucks, well, we're going to make somebody buy those shares from us because we have the right to do that. We'll get $50 bucks a share no matter what the shares are. Uh, our maximum loss at that point is going to be $4,000. Bucks. $4,000, bucks. and here's how we figure it out. Sorry, this should, there should be a zero on the end of there. Let me just add that in on the fly. Maximum loss is 4 bucks. Remember, the price is $52.50. These are $50 puts. So from $52.50 down to $50, we're unprotected. We, we just lose that. We have 1,000 shares. There's $2,500. Plus, we paid $1,500 for the shares. So the most we can lose here is $4,000 at this point. But we only paid $40 for the shares. Uh, cash secured put. Uh, again, this is a risk management strategy. And uh, this is what, uh, um, um, uh, how to do this. And I did this for a while on Walmart when Walmart, a couple of years back, Walmart was sitting around uh, the low 50s. And I thought if it got to 47.50, I'd like to buy some shares of Walmart. So I sold puts 
at 4750 because I was absolutely okay with somebody putting the shares to me for 4750. In other words, I was fine with somebody making me pay 4750. I was good with that. So I was willing to sell uh, puts on Walmart at 4750. And in my account, I maintained enough money to buy the shares at 4750 if I had to. That's why it is called a cash secured put. If you write a put and you secure it with cash, there's no risk in your account of not being able to meet that uh, that put. No matter how far the, the price of Walmart would have fallen, I still had enough money to cover it. So let's say that uh, we're going to sell five XYZ December 55 puts. Now this is the beautiful thing about doing something like this. We're going to sell five XYZ December 55 puts. We're going to get $2,425 for doing that. Uh, the stock is already at $52.50. We're selling the $55 puts. Uh, so it'll be put to us. Uh, we know that already. Uh, so we'll set aside $25,075 to buy 500 shares at 55 bucks. So if we bought, if we, this is 5 times 100, 500 shares, uh, it's uh, uh, at 55, the strike is 55. If they get put to us, we're going to need $25,075. So we'll put that aside. Uh, but we got $2,425 for doing this. So we don't have to put $25,000 aside. We only have to put $25,075 minus the $2425. That's all. We, we, we got that from selling the puts. That's our money no matter what happens. So what is our average price for buying the stock? $50.15. Remember, these, uh, these $55 puts are $4.85 each, right? So five of them uh, will come to $24.25. So the average price is $50.15. So sure, we'll pay $55 for them. But we got paid $4.85 a share to do that. And we wanted to buy them. So instead of paying $52.50, we put ourselves in a position where we're only paying $50.15. And we put the cash aside so that when these, uh, when these shares were put to us, we didn't have to scramble for cash. A cash-secured put. And this is a great strategy for uh, um, buying stock that you would buy anyways. So... Uh, I hear sometimes uh, 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 clients might say, if, the, if, the, if this share falls to $50, buy me 1,000 of them. I'd like to buy 1,000 if it falls to $50. In other words, they're saying place a limit order for 1,000 of these shares. My answer to that is, if you want the 1,000 shares, why don't we sell a put at $50? This way here, you'll make money by saying you would buy it. And if the price doesn't fall to 50, you get to keep that money. You get to keep the money. If I put a limit order in and the price doesn't fall to 50, you don't make anything. You make nothing. But if we sell the put and you truly want to buy those shares, let's make some money on it. Let's make some money by selling the put. And if you have to buy the shares, you would have done it anyways with the limit order. The limit order would have executed anyways. So when, uh, uh, when you're uh, uh, thinking about putting a limit order in for something, ask yourself, is this, is this a situation where I could use a cash secured put instead and generate some extra revenue? Because if you don't, if the limit order doesn't execute, you don't get paid. And if the limit order is not going to execute, the cash secured put is not going to be exercised, but you still make money. Naked put writing, kind of like naked call writing, this is extremely dangerous to do. We're just going to go ahead and sell five XYZ December 55 puts. We're going to make $2,425. Our hope is, when we do this, our hope is the stock price will rise above $55. No one's going to make us, pay, no one's going to make us buy it for $55 if they can sell it for more in the market. We're making a bet. When we sell these $55 puts, we're making a bet that the stock price is going to rise above the $55. Bucks, and we get to keep the full $2,425. If the price is above 55 bucks, we keep it. If it's below 55, we lose $500 for every $1 uh, move in the share price. Our break even is $50.15. So, from 52.50, it can drop to $50.15 and we're indifferent. Below that, we start to lose money. What are forwards and futures? And they're, they're the same thing, it's just they're sold differently. Uh, forwards are sold uh, OTC, they're OTC contracts. Futures are exchange-traded forward agreements. 
So any forward agreement that's traded on an exchange <clears throat> is called a futures. Uh, all forwards and futures have a long and a short position. The buyer and the seller both have an obligation now. Uh, unlike options, in options, uh, a buyer uh, of calls or a buyer of puts uh, has a right but not an obligation where the seller has the obligation. Here, with a forward and future, both are locking themselves into an obligation to perform. The buyer has an obligation to buy a specified asset at a specified price by a specified date, and the seller has the obligation to sell it to them. Um, they're in a contract where neither has a right. I want to stress that now. Uh, and the price at which they will transact in the future is set today. It's agreed on today. Features of forwards and futures, they are free to enter. There's no premium. If I buy a call option, I got to pay the other side a premium. If I enter into a futures contract, I don't pay the other side anything. The other side doesn't pay me anything. Other than commissions and exchange fees, they're free to enter into. Uh, many financial futures are cash settled. There is no delivery. So a futures on an index, let's say, uh, would be cash settled. Typically, the futures contract is, it says here, it is for a specific asset at a specific price. There, you, you, you are agreeing to buy and sell a specific asset. But for financial futures, where the underlying is, uh, let's say, an index or currencies, etc., the underlying asset is technically not really delivered. Uh, they're just cash settled. Futures have margin requirements, not forwards now. I said futures. These are exchange trade. They have margin requirements for both the buyer and the seller. The clearinghouse is counterparty to both the buyer and the seller in a, in a futures contract. So from the clearinghouse's perspective, they have two separate contracts, one with a buyer, one with a seller, and they want both to post margin so that they don't lose. Uh, when you have a, a futures contract with margin, there is an initial margin and there's a maintenance margin. If your uh, the money in your account falls too low and you hit the maintenance margin, you have to top your account up again. This is set by the exchange, and there are minimums that are set by the exchange for margin. A broker can require more margin, but never less. And futures contracts are marked to market daily. That means daily settlement. Whatever the price is, whatever the printed closing price is, if one side owes the other side money, they pay up that day. And it's not that you have to do anything. That's what the margin in your account is for. Money leaves your account and it heads over to the other account, or money leaves the other side's account and heads over to yours. All gains and losses are paid, that is settled, each day. So let's, uh, let's just get an idea in our head what this, uh, the idea, we're going to combine the idea of the, the initial margin, the maintenance margin, and the mark to marking every day just to see how that works. Let's say that a buyer and a seller uh, agree on a futures contract on some underlying asset. It could be it could be anything, but the initial margin required by the buyer and the seller is each two thousand. So the buyer puts two thousand dollars in their trading account. Same with the seller, uh, and the maintenance margin is fifteen hundred. So if somebody drops to fifteen hundred, they're going to have to top it back up to two thousand. Let's say after the first day, uh, the futures contract is worth two hundred dollars more. Well, the buyer has the long position, the seller has the short position. If the value of the contract is $200 higher, the buyer gains, the long position gains. So $200 would leave the seller's account, and they now have $1,800, and it would show up in the buyer's account. That happens the same day. The broker takes the money out of your account. Right then and there, it's gone. So at 2.30, you'll notice that the money is gone. Now, uh, starting at the beginning of, uh, of the next day, the buyer has $2,200, the seller only has eighteen. dollars And on day two, the value of the futures contract dropped $300. So at the end of that day, $300 leaves the buyer's account and heads over to the seller's account. Now the buyer has nineteen, the seller has twenty-one. dollars On day three, the value of the contract dropped another $600. So the buyer drops to $1,300, $600 finds its way over to the seller's account, they're at twenty-seven. dollars the maintenance margin is 15. Look what happened here. We're at 13. The buyer is going to get a margin call and has to deposit seven. Not just $200 to get it back up to the maintenance margin. Once you breach the, maiden, the maintenance margin, you must bring it right back up to the full margin. So the uh, buyer here would then have to uh, make arrangements to get $700 into that account to cover that shortfall. Let's look at some strategies uh, for forwards and futures. Speculation. Write out speculation. Buy or sell futures. 
So let's take an example of a futures contract, West Texas Intermediate. This is a U.S. oil contract, an extremely popular uh, U.S. oil contract. The ticker is CL. Uh, the underlying is for 1,000 barrels of oil. And let's say the price is $47. And you have a belief that the price will rise or you have a belief that the price will fall. If you think the price will rise, you will buy one futures contract. Uh, and hopefully the price will go up and you'll make money. If you think that the price will fall further, you will sell one futures contract. That's pure speculation. You can think of $47 as the price of a stock, and you can think of going long as buying the stock, and you, think, you can think of selling the futures as going short the stock. That's all it is, is you just think of this $47 rather than it being the price per barrel of oil. You say, well, that's the price per share of something. It's just I'm not going to short or buy 100 shares. In this case, I have to do a full 1,000 barrels of oil. So you treat it like 1,000 shares. Uh, and if you think it'll go up, you go long. If you think it'll drop, you go short. Uh, and typically the margin's about 5 to 8% of the total value. This is 1,000 barrels at $47, so the exchange will say, well, it's got a value of $47,000. So 5% is 2,350, and up to 8% might be to 3,200. So you'd have to deposit somewhere uh, in that range into your account, and uh, you would profit and loss, uh, uh, or, or profit and lose, uh, by the movement uh, of the price of oil based on a thousand barrels of oil. All right, let's uh, look at doing that again, but this time under a risk management strategy as opposed to pure speculation. And here uh, we'll make both sides uh, involved in risk management. So uh, we have a farmer over here and we have a cattle rancher over here. The farmer is going to grow and sell corn and faces the risk of prices dropping. The cattle rancher buys corn for feed but has the risk of prices rising. Well, the farmer doesn't want the risk of prices dropping and the cattle rancher doesn't want the risk of prices rising. When you have two people with differing views on risk like that, you have a deal that you can make. The farmer will sell a futures contract on corn and lock in the price. Since the farmer is the seller, they must deliver the corn. Well, that's what the farmer's in business for. The farmer makes the corn, grows the corn, makes it, grows it, and delivers it. So the farmer would do, under the futures contract, what the farmer would do anyways, except he's locking in a price. The cattle rancher has now, has now got an obligation to buy the corn, but that's what the cattle rancher does anyways, he buys corn. But now they've locked in the price of corn. So let's say the uh, farmer uh, sells uh, a bushel of corn at $3.80 and the uh, cattle rancher buys a bushel at $3.80 and each contract for corn is for 5,000 bushels. It's for 5,000 bushels. So there we go. Uh, the farmer feels pretty good because the farmer knows with certainty they're going to get $3.80 a bushel. They don't have to worry about the price of corn falling over the summer. If it's a really good harvest and yields are way up, there's going to be a flood of corn on the market. It'll drive the price down. The farmer's going to get $3.80. The cattle rancher, the most they're going to pay is $3.80. Here's the thing. Even though uh, they're hedged out like this, they actually will not take delivery. The cattle rancher will not take delivery of the corn from the farmer, and the farmer really won't deliver the corn to the rancher. What will happen is they'll close out their contracts, and the farmer will then sell the corn in the spot market, and the cattle rancher will go to a different market and buy corn. But here's what goes on. Let's say that uh, September corn is $4 a bushel. It's $4 a bushel. Uh, each contract is for 5,000 bushels. The farmer sold corn at 380. It ended at four bucks. The farmer lost $1,000 on the futures contract. But when the farmer goes to sell uh, the corn in the spot market, they're getting $4 a bushel, not 380. They're getting the higher price. So they'll sell corn for 1,000 more in the spot market. They'll lose 1,000 on their futures contract, but they'll make the extra 1,000 when they bring it to the market. The cattle rancher, on the other hand, made 1,000 bucks on the futures contract. Bought it at 380, it went to four, made a thousand bucks. Walks down the road, buys corn at four dollars a bushel, but has to pay a thousand dollars more than the 380. Made the thousand, lost a thousand, average price 380. Here, lost a thousand, made a thousand, average price 380.